Okay, time to pick through some comments for another Fighters Pass 2 discussion video. I'm a little bit busy today, but I'm sure this won't take too long to get through. Oh. So here we are, back at it again with some more DLC speculation. You guys seem to really like the format of the last video, so I'll be doing something similar today, with even more of your very own suggestions. Once again, keep in mind that the hype level I'm assigning to each character represents my personal excitement at the possibility of each character's inclusion in Smash, while the likelihood score shows what I think their realistic chances are of appearing in the game. If there's a character you'd like to contribute to the discussion, feel free to leave a comment and let me know. Or if you're looking for places to find a more active discussion with me and the rest of my community, you can find the link to my Twitch channel in the description as well as the shiny and new Stabilized Discord. Also make sure to check out the other videos I've done in this series to see if I've already talked about your favorite character. But other than that, I hope you enjoy the video, and without further ado, let's get into it. Hollow Knight when it comes to making a video game, developers will often take inspiration from the games that they themselves have played and loved in their past. This is especially true for indie studios, who are usually more passionately connected to their projects than their AAA counterparts. Either way, two games that are often used for this creative inspiration are Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night. These games are often considered to be the best action-adventure games of all time, and due to the similarities between the titles, their style of design quickly established a new subgenre of games all on their own, appropriately dubbed Metroidvania games. Taking the best parts of these two masterpieces and reintroducing them in a new context is very much easier said than done, and it can be pretty hard to get exactly right. Hitting the sweet spot between fun to explore, open-ended areas, and an endless maze of confusing corridors is something that a lot of developers struggle with. That being said, when an indie developer does manage to do something special with a Metroidvania project, it obviously quickly catches everyone's attention. And this was exactly the case when Team Cherry released Hollow Knight in 2017. Team Cherry were able to effortlessly show their deep understanding of what makes a Metroidvania game work, while also pushing the genre in a few new directions, and it was an indie smash hit. Before it was met with all this critical acclaim though, Hollow Knight actually started as something pretty small. You see, Hollow Knight is technically an extension of a Game Jam project from 2013, known as Hungry Knight. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad they put a little more work into this one too. For those who don't know, a game jam is a contest where the participants take anywhere from one to three days to fully create a video game from scratch. And although in this case it may only be a simple flash game, it's still a great way to focus creativity and see what will stick after you have a playable demo of sorts. Games like Snake Pass, Goat Simulator, and Super Hot all started as game jams, so it goes without saying that this can be a pretty effective way of creating a successful product. In this case though, the design for Hungry Knight was extremely simple and only involved walking around and killing bugs until you run out of time. However, the design for Hollow Knight as well as the giant bug enemies were taken directly from Hungry Knight and this is what started the development of Hollow Knight. I think it's pretty cool that they were able to extend this simple flash game into a fully fledged, now beloved Metroidvania game. So yeah, there's your gaming trivia of the day I guess. In terms of Hollow Knight itself though, the game has responsive and tight controls that make the simple act of movement enjoyable. And with its eye-catching gothic horror aesthetic of underground cities and ruins to pull people in, it took the indie landscape by storm. And with great success, comes a great number of fans wanting the game represented in Smash Bros. So, being a Metroidvania, I'm sure that I don't need to tell you that Hollow Knight has plenty of abilities that could be pulled from to create a nice, tight, packaged little moveset for Smash Bros. From special moves, to neutral attacks, to recovery potential, there's a lot here to pull from and pretty much all of it could fit into Smash quite nicely. I think the strangest thing about Hollow Knight's inclusion would be seeing him in full 3D. Of course I'm not saying he won't be included for this reason, there's plenty of characters who have made the transition into the third dimension specifically for Smash, I just think it might look a little strange and take a while to get used to, that's all. A real concern I do have for his inclusion though is his status as an indie character. I know people hate hearing that a character won't make it in just because they're from an indie game, but I'm not writing Hollow Knight off completely. 
To me, it just seems more unlikely that Nintendo would be willing to strike a deal with some indie studio based in Australia on bringing a full character to the game when compared to the bigger players in the gaming industry. Personally, I feel like if an indie character was going to be playable, it would have been Shovel Knight. But we all know the ship has long since sailed away from that yacht club. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! And sure, Undertale would probably be the second contender in terms of an actual fighter, but now we have a me costume for Sans, and that was only because Toby Fox was literally invited over to Sakurai's house. Just straight up chilling with the creator of Smash, playing a couple games for a playdate doesn't seem like an opportunity that comes up for just any old developer. So, in my mind, the chances for Hollow Knight seem pretty slim. On the other hand, though, that does mean the hype for Hollow Knight's inclusion would be pretty sky high because of all the obstacles in his way. So, don't give up hope on this one quite yet. Even for people who haven't played the game, I'm pretty sure he looks interesting enough from his design to get people curious. Like, what do you got going on underneath that mask anyway? Oh. Oh, what? Oh. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, no. Jesus, God, no! Hype level seven! Likelihood two. Rayman. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Smash Ultimate has transcended from being the Nintendo All-Star Fighter into the video game All-Star Fighter. If you take a look at the top of the top for the most well-renowned gaming icons and mascots, we have more that are in Smash than those that aren't at this point. But the gaming icon I see talked about most often in Smash DLC discussions that still hasn't been given his chance is... Okay, well maybe not the most discussed, but I already talked about him. One of the most discussed I see is Rayman. Now, Rayman has had a bit of an interesting arc over his career, and honestly, I don't think many people look back fondly at his debut on PlayStation. I mean, hey, at least I don't. This... This shit kinda sucks. But soon thereafter, Rayman succeeded where many others failed by jumping into the third dimension with Rayman 2, The Great Escape on N64. And this... Now this is Rayman. This game throws you straight into the action, as if Rayman running around in 3D is no big deal, and it feels great. Why's he got no arms or legs? Who cares? Just play the damn game! Before you even know it, you're platforming like a madman and shooting space pirates with your... energy... balls? Okay, I take it back. PS1 Rayman had something going for it with throwing your fists around at least. Rayman 2 was what solidified Rayman as a true contender in the gaming market, and was able to show off the team's developmental skills in a 3D environment, while also introducing a lot of the characters that became staples of the series, like the Teensies, Glowbox, and Murphy. Yeah, you can take or leave that one. Rayman even managed to successfully come back to 2D platforming with Rayman Origins and Rayman Legends some years later. I gotta say these games have a lot more to offer than the PS1 original does, so if you're a fan of platformers like Donkey Kong Country and what have you, Rayman Legends is on Switch and you should definitely consider picking it up. As a Tribe Called Quest once said, it's like butter, baby. Rayman is able to stand the test of time thanks to his unique design and great gameplay. And although the 3D platformer genre is well represented in Smash, Rayman would be more than cool enough to justify a Fighter's Pass slot. Sadly, he's been missing in action ever since Rayman Legends, which originally released in 2013. If there is a new Rayman game anywhere on the horizon, I think the close relationship Ubisoft has with Nintendo could give our boy a shot at being included in Fighter's Pass 2. Once again, maybe wishful thinking, but let a man dream. I, I don't really know how to end this segment. Um, so I just want to mention he also does cool flips when you jump and land and stuff in Rayman 2. So yeah, he's he's pretty much got my vote. Hype level 7! Likelihood 6. Raymu Hakurei. The Toho Project is a thing. And it is a thing that I do not really understand. But apparently a lot of people really want me to talk about it. Disclaimer, I tried my best. Please do not mutilate me in the comments. Okay. So. The Toho Project is a bullet hell shooter series developed by Team Shanghai Alice, which is a pretty ironic name considering the team consists of, well, only this one guy. These games are unique because instead of flying a ship through space or something similar to other bullet hell games, this game is fully injected with 100% Japan extract and you instead control a little girl with the ability to fly and shoot lasers. 
What have I gotten myself into? The first five games were available exclusively in Japan for PC-98 computers in the late 90s, and were developed by a company called Amusement Makers, which Zune eventually left to create Toho games for Windows PCs, which were dominating the market by the early 2000s. And ever since then, he's been pumping these bad boys out on a pretty consistent basis. Zune does everything for these games, from the art, to the music, to the actual programming, so it's pretty impressive how many he's been able to make over the years. There are a lot of Toho games, and if you include all the fan-made games as well, things get really wacky really fast. You see, Toho is one of the kings of fan-made works in Japan, and rather than shutting people down, Zune has encouraged people to pursue projects of their own using his IP as a basis. The Japanese culture tends to consider these fan projects a celebration of their work and will allow them in most cases, unlike in the West where you'd get sued for copyright almost immediately. If someone wants to publish an indie game using Toho characters, they can do so and even sell it for a profit with no fear of Zune coming after them. Because of this, Toho is everywhere in Japan, from fan art, to music remixes, to completely original games made using the characters. There's bullet hell games developed by fans in the same Toho style, of course, but there's also some really strange stuff out there too. There's fan-made Toho versions of Castlevania and Pokemon, even Age of Empires, who spent their time making this? That being said, even if you're only taking into account the official games made by Zune himself, things can still get quite strange with the numbering of the entries. Seriously, how can you be the 12.8th game in a series? I just don't understand! So yes, it can seem like the barrier to entry is quite high, but at the end of the day, the games themselves are pretty simple. You can pretty much get the idea of the games just by watching these little bits of gameplay. You use bombs and spells and other special powers to shoot lasers and kill opposing demons and spirits. There's four difficulties to play on, with the higher difficulties having higher amounts of bullets and attacks to dodge, as well as a higher likelihood that you'll smash your computer to bits after playing for about 20 seconds. So let's talk about Reimu herself. Hakurei Reimu, known as the Shrine Maiden of Paradise, is considered the main character of the series. She uses yin-yang orbs for attacks and spells, can teleport short distances, and specializes in the use of barriers for defensive as well as offensive techniques. And other than that, you just kinda... shoot stuff. I think it's pretty clear that Reimu being included in Smash would be a celebration of Toho as a cultural phenomenon more so than the character in the games itself. I mean, I know Zune does all the art himself, but come on, man, some of this is just... Well, just look at it. I don't know what to say. Like, you want this in Smash? There's also a couple Toho fighting games that were developed in a partnership with Twilight Frontier. And honestly, this is a lot more up my alley. At the end of the day, it's still little girls beating the hell out of each other, which makes me quite uncomfortable. But at least it shows the merit of the Toho cast in a fighting game setting. Reimu has melee attacks using a gohei, a type of Japanese wand made of wood and paper, as well as paper charms and portals that are incorporated into her moveset. All I can really say is... Yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool. I think we can all agree that the likelihood of Reimu's inclusion is pretty slim. Like I said, I understand that Toho is kind of a cultural phenomenon that has just recently started to make its way to the West in the last decade or so, but at the end of the day it would just kind of be an odd inclusion. I understand the cultural significance of Toho in Japan, but the realistic outlook is that pretty much everywhere else in the world has no idea who these characters are, or at the very least, the people from other parts of the world who play Smash Brothers. A very unlikely inclusion that would not be exciting for most people. However, if you're a fan of this series, I can see why your hype level would be at 25 out of 10 if Reimu got included. But, that's not me. And this is my list and my hype level. Okay, I'll give you one thing. The music from Toho being in Smash would be absolutely incredible. You hear this? Man, this shit goes off! Hype level three. Likelihood two. <laughs> Waluigi. Ah, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Smash Ultimate had just been revealed, and everyone was speculating about if the game would be a brand new Smash installment, or just a port of Smash 4 with some additional characters and features. But when E3 finally rolled around, all our questions were answered. Holy Mario on a mushroom! That's a new game, alright! Not only did we get every character who has ever appeared as a Smash fighter returning for Ultimate, but we also got the reveal of one of the most requested characters of all time, Ridley. But somehow, 
This still wasn't enough for you people, was it? The presence of Waluigi returning as an assist trophy caused more than a little outrage in the community, and the fans soon took to Twitter to make sure Sakurai knew it. If I'm being honest, even I was hoping to see Waluigi included as a fighter in Ultimate before the Big E3 blowout, but since then I've lost interest just because of the behavior of the fanbase. I understand the love for Waluigi, and he's definitely one of the more unique and interesting Mario characters, but blowing up Sakurai's Twitter mentions and sending death threats to developers when you don't get your way is not a way to help your cause. Things have calmed down a lot since then, but to me, the weeks of harassment that followed E3 of 2018 is a stain on the Waluigi hype train that's pretty hard for me to just wipe clean and forget about. Hell, even people outside of the gaming community were catching wind of the outrage. The Washington Post had an article about Waluigi not being a playable fighter in Smash Ultimate. Yes. The Washington Post got involved. This Waluigi apocalypse showed the worst side of the Smash fanbase not just to the gaming community, but the entire world and the public eye. It was honestly embarrassing to be associated with a community exhibiting this kind of behavior. I get that Waluigi is the king of memes and all that, but come on guys, let's behave ourselves from now on, okay? So, doing my best to sweep that under the rug, Waluigi has a fighter himself. He's got plenty of wacky ways to swing at his opponents, and if you want a pretty good basis for what a moveset could look like for him, he was implemented in Project M pretty well. There isn't a whole lot of source material to pull from, but even using his essence as a character to whack people around in silly ways would be more than acceptable here. There's also some misinformation about Sakurai being quoted saying he didn't include Waluigi in the roster because he felt that the support for the character was insincere, but this quote never actually had a source, and it's likely just made up to fit the Nintendo hates Waluigi narrative. I'm happy to backtrack on this if anyone has a reliable source for this comment, but it's been two years since Sakurai supposedly said this, and I've never been able to find anything. Even in this case though, I still don't think Waluigi's very likely. I've got a feeling Sakurai would rather focus on introducing new series to Smash with the DLC instead of pulling from existing ones if he at all had a choice. Piranha Plant was initially intended to be included in the base game, so he's out of the discussion, and I know we got Byleth in the last Fighter's Pass, but that was a choice made by Nintendo. Sakurai even said that he was reluctant to add another Fire Emblem character, but because he thought he could put a unique spin on them with a multi-weaponed, not just another sword fighter approach, he agreed to do it. I think the idea of a Super Mario character in the Fighter's Pass is a bit underwhelming and leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths who are looking to extend the reach of game biggest crossover, even if it is a fan favorite like Waluigi. I also think Sakurai might just be petty enough to hold a grudge against all the people who wanted him and harassed him. I mean, I sure would be. I think if we were to get Waluigi, which I still don't think that we will, it would be after Fighters Pass 2 in some kind of a solo sale. You know, after Fighters Pass 2 is over, they just put up single characters every now and then that aren't really that exciting to people and just sell them on their own. That's where I see Waluigi fitting. You know what? Scratch that. After Fighters Pass 2 is finished, don't even give us Fighters Pass 3. Just give us Fighters Pass Wa. Six Waluigis for $30. I mean, shit, I'd pay for it. Hype level 5. Likelihood 3. Minecraft Steve. Oh, sorry, what's that? Oh, we're out of time? Alright, see you guys later. Hey, thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. That's all the characters I have time for today, but there's plenty more where that came from. So, once again, feel free to give me suggestions in the comments or in my Discord or in my Twitch stream where I'm live every Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Also, make sure to check out the other videos in this series right on the screen to see if I've already talked about your character. And other than that, thanks a lot, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye for now!